Hello everyone, Trish Jenkins here on Trish TV, broadcasting to LinkedIn, to YouTube, and also to my Trish TV Facebook page. And shortly I will I will um, transfer it also to my personal page. Uh, but I've, I've, this is a really special interview. It's, there's going to be two, and we're going to be um, it, talking about the, the artistic stuff of, of Tim Hall, um, and then we're going to do a second interview that is going to explore more deeply where he's gone into in ministry. But what's really important is Tim is actually, just like you, he is, so I'm looking at my screen here. Uh, in fact, I want to show you one of the most beautiful pictures that he has done that I absolutely love. Let me find it for you. Um Let me find it for you. Uh, this one here I'm bringing up. I'm going to share my screen while I look for changing it, uh, being able to share to share. Good. Move that. This is his Charge of the Light Brigade. It is 10 feet long and it is, it is everything resilient about Australia. There's a story behind it I'm going to ask him about during our interview. And uh, the thing is, it you know, with this pot, with this um, lockdown that we've been having, you know, you know that I've been locked up before. Well, people in Melbourne can feel, you know, people who are in lockdown feel locked up and it can drive you crackers. And it's, it's, it's so hard. And I just want this time to be a time of relaxing and story sharing but also I'm going to talk to Tim about his challenges and what has helped him. This is his artwork, but he didn't always do art. He, he started learning it and then he, he didn't do it. He was doing other things. And when adversity came, he had an outlet that turned into something massive. And we're going to talk about that. Um, and uh, we're going to, did I do that? Did I share that? Share share oh i know what i've got to do here just bear with me i've got to change who i'm doing this through i'm doing it through me and then i can share and share now so that should be going to my welcome to my personal page as well so having done that this beautiful man that i'm talking to has not only done it tough in life and come out the other side not that he's on the other side of life but he's also, he's had a knee reconstruction. I've managed to catch him because he can't do a heck of a lot. He can't get around a lot. He's and he can, he's getting better now. But we've got him. We've got him today. So um, we're out, we're here, we're, we're enjoying life now over the internet. That's how we've got to do it. So Tim Hall, welcome to our program and thank you so much for sharing your time with us <laughs> thanks trish thank you <laughs> there we go a little bit of a long introduction because i was trying to get things sharing right and then part way through we'll be switching some of the um social media to uh the more ministry focused things but just to, Tim, clar just, just to yeah. clarify that that's actually the charge at beersheba not the charge beersheba. of the light brigade charge of the light brigade was um that was a few hundred years ago with the british the famous charge uh, I was in the Crimean War or something like that, but the, that was the charge at Beersheba. And uh, okay. my, my great uncle was second in command at that. Yeah. Oh, look at it. It is just magnificent. It I, is tried your I just tried to capture the, uh, you know, I was very excited when I found that my great uncle was second in command there and also led the fourth light horse in the taking of Damascus. And it's one of a series of war paintings that I've done that are, Actually, over in uh, South Australia, they're going into a very significant house in um, in the Adelaide Hills. There's four of them uh, covering Air Force, Navy, uh, the Battle of the Somme, Beersheba, um, and uh, early biplanes, and also a big naval battle. So wow. I've done four of them. They're all about 10 feet long, and I've enjoyed doing them. They've been a tremendous piece of history. And the study with it, of course, was fun. And I just love doing these. Plus, I got paid well for them. So that's all good. Yes. 
Well, that's great. So that's given people a taste. But that was one that really spoke to me. Well, I'm, I'm a horse girl anyway. I, I, I love it. And, and the history and Carl Stringer teaches a lot on, uh, you know, the the um, the Australian Army and, and the history and so on. And it's so amazing to hear those stories. So, Carl. Sorry, Tim. Yes. <laughs> Tim. Hello. Tim. Talk to me. What would you like? Would you like to go back? I can. We were talking about maybe going through these paintings of yours and, and sharing a bit of your story uh, and um, what it took for some things that you went through that required some resilience and how you how you got to there. <coughs> Excuse me. I've, yeah. Um, You're right for some water. Yeah. Very good. Just excited. No, I should have got some water, but I'm okay. We'll be right. Well, art art's part of my life. It's just. Um, it has had a significant role. Um, it's not my major um, thing in life that I do, but it has a significant part. Um, I painted and I used to ask for a pen. Before I could walk, I used to sit in my pram and Aww. ask for pencil and paper. And so as a kid, um, I was an only child. I, my sister was stillborn. She died at birth. So I was brought up and mum had had a, a big fall down a mine shaft um, at one stage, and she was um, pretty. Un I'm just trying to work out where to look, where the camera is here, so I can look your way. How's that? Is that good? That's good. Yeah. And so, Mum had a fall down a mine shaft. I think she fell 50, 60 feet, damaged her pelvis and stuff. And my sister nearly died. I was close to death. I was just. Dad said when I was born, I was like a scum rabbit. And so that was it. They didn't have any more kids. And so I was raised an only child. And as an only child, you, you've got to entertain yourself. And art was really, for me, a great fascination. Dad was a very good watercolorist, and I would sit with my dad and go over books on the great artists of history, and I'd watch him work and watch him. He was a fine watercolorist. And uh, so, you know, it was, a, it was natural for me. Drawing was like a, I would sit at home, and uh, Dad used to bring stuff back. He was at Fortuna in Bendigo in the military base and he would bring back pens and inks and stuff and from the mapping he was in the topographical he'd come back from the war and he um he was regimental sergeant major up in bendigo at a place called fortuna and so they mapped by hand they used to use uh, rulers wow. and pens and and he would bring celluloid back and stuff and i used to do little um <laughs> pieces that we put through a projector and i would draw them very carefully and then project them up on the wall and as a kid, I was very inventive with all that, and uh, and I was never never bored. As a, as a kid, I still I'm still never bored. I still um, uh, try and fill my days either writing books or um, or preaching or or yeah. uh, painting. And uh, I, I've got my studio. I get down in there and paint. And I mean, every day I think to be bored is a very sad situation. And um, some people say they're bored with life. Well. Uh, I think it's a sad thing. And so art was very big for me. Um, I were went you through in the country? school. Where, where were you as a small child? I was born up in Bendigo. Dad oh, you said Bendigo. That's right. Yeah, yeah Dad was the RSM at the uh, military base. And, okay. um, and at 55, he had to retire. And so we moved to Adelaide when I was 10. And I went okay. to school there, went to high school. I was pretty good at school. I did, uh, in primary school, I did particularly well. I was... Uh, topped everything at school and and uh i think in the the final exam in grade seven over there i uh made one mistake that cost me the ducks of the school as it and then i got into a a major school that was they picked the top 70 kids um from all the primary schools and they did a we all did this exam and the, uh, and and they picked from 200 kids from all the pro top primary schools they picked 70 of those top 200 to go into what was the, the school of mines. And uh, so I went there, but I wasn't able to do art. I had to do tech drawing um, and basically a technical, it was a technical school under the school of mines, significant school in Adelaide. It was Adelaide Technical High School, but I wasn't able to do art. And I finished that. And uh, when I finished the my schooling there, um, I, I was accepted to do, um, Oh, accountancy, which would have killed me. That would have been the, <laughs> would have been the end because I hated maths, really. And uh, so, uh, so anyway, the I've got my phone is off, but it's 
calling. Anyway, there it is. Um, so then I, I, uh, I thought, what am I going to do? And I went to the education department and said, look, I'd, I'd like to teach art. And they said, have you done art at school? I said, no, I haven't done art at school. I just, um, but I, they said, we'll give you one week, produce a portfolio. And um, I did that. And I was accepted straight away, went to the School of Art in South Australia and uh, did pretty well. I think I got top credit in painting in the last year and okay. uh, went out as a school teacher. So I was an art teacher. And I think there's some pictures there of those early days. But uh, that's how it started. And all I ever wanted to do back then, um, Mr. that's the cool. 60s. I mean, look at was, you. Uh, that was the, uh, the 60s look. I mean, that's about as 60s as it gets. And... Um, the whole aim was really to to be one of, and that, that's the School of Art in South Australia. It's been knocked down now. It's it's apartments, but that's the old South Australian School of Art. We've got great memories there, training in art. Um, I loved every minute of it. And then when I went to the country, um, I went as a, an art teacher out to a place called uh, Lucendale in South Australia. And um, but all I wanted to do was paint, and so that's a mural I painted. It was that's yep. only three or four panels. It was a hundred square feet. There's another panel on the end, so that's only three or four. Wow! And uh, it it kept going, huge, bright coloured, and I wanted to paint these massive murals, and and uh, that was my passion in life. I wanted to be um, Australia's greatest abstract painter. That was my goal. Um, okay. And then I uh, I went through some really difficult years. Um, yeah. as a school teacher, didn't Sorry? You? you stopped painting for a while. No, I was yeah. painting, I was painting for a long time. All okay. the time, I was teaching. Uh, I used Great. to get in the shearing shed and get stuck into the, the uh, port and get myself, you know, going and crank up the shearing shed. And, and so, I painted for those years, and uh, and I, you know, I was working at it right through until. I really had some crisis in my life, and okay. uh, and uh, I became a Christian, and and I found that you know at that point um, my whole passion changed, and it changed for a number of years. Um, How much uh, do you I, want to share with us about what what the crisis was going on? You don't have to share anything that's going to put you in jail or anything, but um, oh no, the cri the crisis for me at that point was that I was a chronic drunk. I drank tequila like water. Okay. Um, I would actually um, go to the pub at lunchtime and line up the shots of tequila and, and then start up again at night. I, in the afternoon, I'd be teaching school. I'd be drunk as anything in the afternoons, even though wow. I, I was given a senior master position. I was put on the list after three years. And, uh, and so, you know, I was, I was crazy. And, uh, and I had some really bad demonic situations happen in my life that huh? affected me deeply. Um, I think I was going through a, a, almost a self-destruct time. And uh, in the middle of that, um, I wound up going to a church and being, uh, I had a dramatic encounter with the Lord, with, with Jesus, what, and turned my life. What, what prompted you to go to a, like, you're drinking for a long time. Yeah. You've got these, you know, as you've, you've called them, demonic things going on, which, you know, obviously really bad. What were you feeling then and and what made you think maybe I'll go to a church? Because I always believed in God, even even when I was drunk and I'd be out in the bush and I'd go out and I'd, and I'd say, I know you're out there because, you know, you, the skills and the ability to be able to take your thoughts and your, yeah. your emotions and through incredible motor skills that are so complex through your hands, your eyes, your emotions to put stuff on the canvas that's going to influence people so those very emotions can be felt there cannot yeah. just happen. And and I knew that. I didn't want God because I didn't want to live right for him. But okay. at the same time, I knew he was there. And I, I knew that uh, it was pointless trying to fight that, that reality. And okay. And then I had a couple of really bad experiences. I had a really demonic experience one night that, uh, where it, I was at a particular house that had a polygus ghost that I'd gone to check out, and this thing came all over me, and I thought it was going to possess me. Wow. And, I, and I fought that off and then drove 30, 30 miles home. I'd been put off the property where I, I was living because I, I bashed their son and 
uh, mm. had to live in a caravan and I was a mess. And, uh, and uh, I was enjoying life though. I was living it up and going crazy. And it wasn't like sin is so unpleasant. It was, I, I was enjoying the craziness, but I knew. And then one night I went home to my, my apartment and uh, this friend of mine who'd been through a marriage breakup and had nowhere to stay, he was in the other room. He had the, my painting room. So it's a miracle the Terps didn't kill him and the, the smell of turps, but he'd flipped out and he took a, uh, um, uh, a knife, a big knife and carved into his arm and cut mm. up all his face and he was lying there. And that freaked me and I knew, and I actually had, I actually had a voice speak to me that night, say, you're on a, a slippery slide and if you keep going where you're going, you're going to a lost eternity. And wow. then, I, then my life turned around um, I, uh, shortly after that, I went to Africa, of all things. So I, I took a, a trans-African safari, um, flew across to Kenya, um, got on, and then by truck we travelled for four and a half months right through Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Zaire, Central African Republic, Cameroons, Nigeria, um, and uh, went right through, camped in the game parks, camped in it just to... Uh, and I was working then, I took time out when it worked in shearing sheds and prior to that I worked in building sites um, and then did that trip to Africa. But I was saved I, uh, as a Christian then, I, I was uh, just reading, all I wanted was the Bible and I'd sit in the truck and going through Africa and through some really hairy experiences. I was just becoming totally convinced that I wanted to be a preacher, which I wow. did. I be, and so we launched into ministry and um when i got back and i finished up within 12 months of getting back i was pastoring a church i'd started a church while i was school teaching i was an art teacher a senior master of an art department and i couldn't help myself we finished up getting all these kids coming and finished up with a church so after 18 months still as a school teacher i'm now with a pastoring a church in a sort of a fashion and that's gone on and we got a building and a whole lot of things. And, and then I went from there to, uh, I became the youth pastor of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest Pentecostal churches in Australia, began to travel, began to go all over the, all over Australia. Then internationally, I started to move out and, and became, um, you know, very, po I guess, popular anyway. I'm, and, and I did all the youth conferences and Easter conferences and conventions. And that went on and it just got bigger and bigger and I started to do big mass crusades. And then one night I was up in New Guinea um, preaching right up in, a, uh, up in the highlands in a dangerous place up there. And I remember having the best night, the most incredible night that I could ever remember with people being healed and miracles and everything happening. And that night I, I went to bed, I felt like, man, this is so exciting. This is the start. And I woke up in the night absolutely paranoid, absolutely out of my mind with a sense of fear in the room. Wow. And I heard, the, I heard a voice, I heard the Lord say to me, your marriage is under siege. And uh, I cancelled a very big series of meetings in, uh, up in New Britain, flew home, contacted the guy and he said, uh, I said, I have to go home. He said, why are you going? I said, They're my my family, I just know there's something very wrong. And he said, Tim, I'd be very upset about this because we've done a lot of organisation, but I spoke to my guys and I said, um, family comes first and that's the big deal. So I flew home and uh, I knew that things were, and I still to this day don't fully understand it all, but I knew things weren't right. And um, I went home and I tried to get things back and, um, and uh, then I came home one day and, and I, was, I was a single father with three kids. Um, wow. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I don't, I don't blame her either. It was a lot of stress and a lot of pressure and economic pressure. And I was ambitious and there's so many things. Um, it wasn't a moral situation. I think it just was so much pressure from so many angles. And I believe the enemy got, he knew where I was pushing in with prayer and fasting and I was living in long fasts. I was, you know, doing forty-day fasts and and really touching things. And and then um, so suddenly I've got the kids. 
I was due to do a big crusade in the Solomon Islands. How many and, children? Uh, I'm three between my wife and I now. We've got five. But okay. I went to the Solomons and I didn't want to go. And in the middle of that, we had a revival. That's something maybe you'd like to talk about in the next session. But we had a revival in the worst time of my life. And when I came back, the pastor said to me, what are you going to do? And I said, Pastor Andrew, I, I'm going to pull out and get my family together. He said, I'm shocked about that. He said, you've just come back from a total revival, the greatest thing you've ever seen. And I said, yeah, I know, but I've just got to get the family. So um, then I didn't have a job. So I got before the Lord and I said, what do I do? Mm. I don't want to go back school teaching. And I was up on a hill and I'd been, I'd been fasting for a number of weeks mm. and I was standing on a hill and I looked out over that hill and I could see uh, basically all these beautiful, um, oh, I guess they were, oh, I'm trying to think, it's like, I can't remember, but it was these plants that were waving in the breeze and, and uh, uh, thistles, I think it was big thistle bushes. And they're all waving and out the back was the Adelaide Hills. They're all blue and there were buildings. And God spoke to me and said, what do you got in your hand? And I said, uh, mm. so what do you got in your hand? What ability have you got? And I said, well, I can paint a bit and uh, never sold a painting in my life to that point. Never sold one. And he said, go paint some paintings. And so I... I went to my father's house because he's a watercolorist. I said, Dad, can I get some paper and some paints? And he said, sure. So I went home and I said, and I, I just said, Lord, what do I paint? So I began to paint um, landscapes, blue hills and the stuff I saw, fence posts, um, outhouse buildings, um, old farmhouses. And so I did about six paintings. And I so thought, these aren't bad. Uh, let me just slot in there. You were totally devastated. Totally. Every, even though you'd, you'd had this big high from having that success in what yep. you do yep. and then your family and then you've got nothing and you're looking out and, and you know, there are people today who feel like where they've got that their, their, their job has ended because of COVID or, or whatever yep. and their marriages are breaking up because yep. people are stressed they're, they're locked down together and they're fighting because they just can't handle it anymore. Yep. And they're just looking at everything dark. Yep. And it's a hard, I mean, I, I know that feeling because I've lost everything and I've sat in a prison cell just going, my God, I've, I've wrecked my life. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was shattered. I was shattered beyond words. Yep. Beyond words. You can't shattered. even. You I was very can't. aware. I was, I was pushing into God. There was the sweetness of the Lord. And an incredible sense of having had my guts ripped out. Wow. Wow. And then I just started to paint. So what I wanted to catch was you said you heard a voice say, what's in your hand? Yeah. I heard the Lord say that to me. What have you got in your hand? In your hand. Yeah. And that, you know, and I want I just want to pause here and make that a great encouragement to people watching and listening because this is mm -hmm. the recordings of this are going to go on our podcast as well for listening. If you're doing it tough, I want you to pause. I invite you to pause and think, what's in my hand? Whether you know God or you don't, what's in your hand? Because there is hope. There's always something there. Yeah. And, and Tim was at that point, I've been at that point, what's in your hand? And, and don't ever give up hope. Don't ever give up hope and think, you know, that the suicide rates are up, there's all these things going on. But this COVID thing will pass and you'll still be standing, but what's in your hand? You never give up hope. I, I, what you've said inspired me so much, Tim. It's, I don't well, Darlene, know. Darlene Check is a friend of mine. I've known Darlene for years and she was at a very, very low point, even to the point of depression and going through sheer hell. And she got on the piano and she began to sing Shout to the Lord. Yeah. Now, Shout to the Lord is probably, apart from Amazing Grace, there's very few songs written or sung in history that have 
um, probably been sung by any, many more people than that. And, uh, and yet she wrote that in the darkest of times and yet that probably opened to her massive doors. She and did. It's very, I think, and I think it's that's in, the one that um, won an aria. Yeah. Is that the one that won the aria? Yeah. That, uh, yeah, and Richard Wilkins had to look up who she was and where she was from. He's like, he's like who do you think? <laughs> so, so that's just so powerful. Thank you so much for that. I just wanted to pause there because it's it's easy to, you know, when you've got a story, it's easy to just throw out a few sentences to cover it. But, it, you know, you sometimes you need to really pause and savour what was really going on to get the magnitude of it, and you still can't. But the important thing is that there's hope. And uh, and for you, that I mean, for, for other people, it might be different things, but for you and I, it has been faith. And, uh, and today, more people than ever are more open-minded about that. You know, and, and that's what I would invite people to do is to be open minded. I know we're on LinkedIn. I know we're on my my business YouTube and um, I'm thinking about how I'm going to switch these over when we transition. <laughs> and maybe we pretty we'll, easy. <laughs> yeah. So um, maybe we'll switch over now. And if you want, because this is a good transition point, because I really want to get into the spiritual side of things. Mm. And, and art is a great therapy. If, if that's something that people are into, that's been great to help you with your coping and with your resilience. But then when you moved into the faith side of things, you had that for when things went wrong. So what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end the LinkedIn broadcast. And if you're on LinkedIn and you're seeing this, you can go to my, either, um, go to my uh, YouTube channel. I've got two YouTube channel, one for business and one for ministry. And... Uh, you can also go to my Trish TV. Uh, if you go at Trish TV podcast, that's when my Trish TV will will broadcast. I'm going to leave it on that one. I'm going to leave that one going, um, and we'll say goodbye now for the LinkedIn. And I will then put in my. Um, let's see. We'll remove this one. Goodbye. Thank you. And just bear with me. We will also remove from the save changes. We'll go from the business uh, YouTube. So you can switch over. If you do YouTube uh, Trish, YouTube slash Trish Jenkins Faith, then you will YouTube.com slash Trish Jenkins Faith. You will find me there. Or you can come to um, my, uh, you, my Facebook um, one. 